I think it's great to have a series of type of papers we love because I think that you know, intellectual, the, the ideas of computer science are so interesting and so ingenious and so rich and diverse that it's a great, um, a great thing to do as a, you know, as a uh, coalescing topic. So this, this one is about, um, I was first inspired by this when I heard talks by Andrew Goldberg uh, who's my colleague at Microsoft Research, and he gave me this, this talk about a problem that I thought was way back in you know, the 1960s sorted. But it turns out that the shortest path problem has been, a, has been not just around for a long time, but is in very active state of development, and it embodies some really clever ideas. So I hope that by the time you go away tonight, you'll think, A, shortest path algorithms are much more interesting than I thought, and B, there's some really clever ideas that I actually understand now that I didn't know about before. So I'd be, I, I hope you, you get some of that, right? And so it would be much more fun for me if you would uh, um, you know, do me the honor of uh, interacting as we go along, ask questions, make comments. We will nevertheless finish within an hour, um, right? but uh, uh, one way or another, by uh, skipping if necessary, but it, it, it's more fun to sort of stay together and engaged, actively you know, engaging with the material, rather than to slump back you know, the end of a, what's the day? A Thursday, yes. Uh, you're in a good part of your week, right? So don't slump, uh, because we're going to have lots of, lots of actual ideas. Okay. So far so good. Um, here is the setup. Well, I want to find you know, my way from uh, here to Rome, so you, you know, do all this web page stuff and you say, uh, uh, get the directions. We do, you know, look, I did this on the way here, just to find my way from London Bridge. And, uh, and so what, what's going on? So something is happening on your phone. Um, and of course, this is just the shortest path algorithm of all sort of streets and connections, which the uh, um, computers know about. And there are well-known algorithms that are fast enough on you know, big computers, right? That is even doing a you know, dynamic site thing, which I'll show you, on a, on a, a serious computer will be fine for this. But on a handheld machine, it's really not quite as fine, right? The, uh, you know, a, a reason, the, the, they're pretty powerful, but not that powerful. And moreover, if we could, um, uh, if we could do a better job, I mean, even if you've got a well-known algorithm, <coughs> and you could figure out a better way of doing the same thing faster and with less energy, the world would be a better place, right? Even if it was operating in a data center doing, you know, your, and your search was actually taking place somewhere else. So, um, I really like this stuff because it demonstrates very nicely, so I get this, this talk also in a sort of schools context, illustrates the power of abstraction, it illustrates about reasoning, about algorithms to figure out subtle algorithms, if they're really, really right, reasoning about the space-time trade-off, that you might pay a little bit of space to save a lot of time, um, and it, it, it embodies the idea that you might have a single problem that really has a lot of algorithms. Okay, so that's my sort of meta goal, is to sort of keep these far. So here's the, more specifically, the picture for tonight. So, um, if I want to find the shortest path from A to B, there are various ways I could do it. So, one way is the way my mother did it, I'll tell you about this. Then there's a Dijkstra's algorithm, which we'll jump straight to. Um, and that survived quite a long time, except that, that you know, there was a bi-directional version. And then there was this really interesting paper called A star. This is still about 1968, quite a while ago. Right. Then there was quite a long period in which really not a lot seemed to happen. It was as if they thought, okay, we're done, right? And then these guys, inspired by uh, you know, the, 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 this um, problem, uh, my colleagues at Microsoft and others, started to think maybe we could do better. And they found lots of ways to do better. Um, and uh, you know, so I'm going to show you one, I'm going to sketch another. And then beyond that, there's yet more papers that I've discovered since that I don't yet, yet understand. So it's, it's sort of, it, this is really active today, even though you know, this, is, this is a year after I was born, is when that paper was first published. That, that, yeah, it's, a, it's a really long time scale, okay? Now, uh, here's what we're going to do. Uh, how do we find the fastest way from A to B? Well, you, um, you, know, you just put, uh, you, know, you, you put spots on all the intersections, and then you, uh, you, know, you pay people to walk or cycle or drive in cars down all these things, so you figure out how long it takes to get from, from one to the other, taking account of the traffic or the speed of the road, or you know, how, how wide the road is, and so forth. And these are the, um, the lines between them, and then you sort of measure how long it takes to get along all of these lines, and then you can, um, and then you sort of rub out the roads, because if I want to get from uh, here to up to here, I don't really need to think about the wiggles in the roads, I just say, what are the dots I want to get from this dot to that dot, and I want to follow these lines. Once you've figured out the shortest path, oh, I think this was the shortest path from here to here, actually, then uh, I figure out actually that it goes in this wiggly route, and then I can replace that on the map, and there's doubtless some clever um, wiggly line drawing algorithms that follow the real lines on the map. Okay? Um, so this is, that's, that's what could, of course, what is really happening. Um, and you, uh, when you actually show it, you throw away all the spots, like to show it back to your consumer. Um, so it's a, um, and, you know, underlying this, uh, you know, the, 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 what the consumer sees, as it were, is a pretty abstract problem. That is, a collection of nodes or vertices, 
and edges that join them, um, actually bidirectional ones in this case, there are lots of variants, sometimes they're directional, um, with numbers on them that indicate how costly it is to traverse the graph. And the, the, problem, the problem description is, given two points A and B, find the shortest path from one to the other. Um, and while I've uh, you know, uh, described this as being something to do with road systems, of course it works for lots of other things like, you know, what's the fastest way to get this job done, the critical path through a perp chart? And so it's a, it's a classic example, you know, if you're illustrating this to anybody else, like tutoring somebody in computer science, say, this is abstraction, like this one problem, this one problem applies to many examples, and then we're going to see lots of algorithms to solve this problem. So it's, very, it's a sort of powerful point of leverage to identify these abstractions that we can solve in many ways, and which then apply in many places. Okay, so this is all, I mean, I'm going quickly here, because I'm assuming this is all really old hat to you. I'm just setting the scene. Okay, so far? Yeah. All right. So now, um, what does my mother do? Well, there are lots of ways of solving this problem from A to B. One is simply to get in the car and drive. Right? It's a good randomized algorithm. Every time you come to an intersection, you choose a turning. And eventually, you know, sometime within the lifetime of the universe, perhaps, you will arrive at the destination. You just spot when you get there. And apart from that, so it's a, uh, I always think that we, we underplay randomized algorithms. This particular one is a really bad randomized algorithm because it's awfully slow, but it will terminate, right? It will eventually get there in any finite graph. So that's a good property for an algorithm to have. And it's simple, and that's also good. So there's a whole another thing you could you should have a you should do a papers we love about randomized algorithms because they're really cool um, and, and rather well understood. Okay. Okay. So now we're going to get to something that um, uh, uh, that actually has some, some payload. Who who um, who has heard of Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest path? Okay. So almost everybody. Who believes that they could um, say what it does? No. Okay. A smaller number. So I don't tell you what it does. Right, so because it, but it's, it is, it's really very clever, right? It was invented by um, Dutch the year after I was born. So here's how it works. We're going to start today, we're going to go to B. We're going to divide the vertices into three groups the um, green ones, the yellow ones, and the red ones. Now, the red ones we've not examined at all, so we know nothing about them. The yellow ones are going to constitute our work list, they're the ones we're going to consider doing some work on. And the green ones are sort of passive for the moment. And each of the, the green and the yellow ones, we're going to also associate as well as the color, a number. And this number is going to be something like, it's going to say, if it's green N or yellow N, it means there's a path of length N from A, the starting point, to this vertex. Okay? That's the, the intuition I want to carry, you to carry with you about yellow N or green N. Okay? Um, so I'm going to start off with A being yellow, zero, because there is a zero length path from A to A for sure, um, and then everything else red. And here's Dutch's algorithm, it just says, choose the yellow N vertex with the smallest n, make it green, which puts it in, you know, takes it off the work list, and tell the neighbors. Now I'm going to tell you what that means in a, in a second, but the, and then, then I'm just going to do that again, and again, until b, that's my destination, turns green. Okay? Now I have to tell you what tell the neighbors is before this can make any sense at all. Here's what it means. When I turn the vertex to green, green n, because it was, it was yellow n before, I turn it to green n, I don't change n when I make the color switch for the vertex. But what I am going to do is for each neighbor w of v, v is the one I'm working on, I just turned it green, for each neighbor w, I'm going to look at it, right? it's by neighbor, I mean one arc away, one hop away, down an edge of length k. Okay, now what am I going to do? If w was red, I'm going to turn him yellow. Well, in all cases, I'm going to turn him yellow, actually. Oh, not, sorry, not in all cases, I'll take that back. If it's red, I'm definitely going to turn it yellow. And I'm going to say n plus, his label is n plus k. Why? Because this says there's a path of length n to b, so there's certainly a path of length n plus k to w. Okay? And that was what the n plus k means here. And yellow means <coughs> I'm going to probably do some more work on it later. Okay, it's in my work list. What about yellow? Yellow n. Well, basically, I'm going to turn it into yellow n plus k, but but remember, if this guy already has a really short path for me, right, I don't want to increase the, 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 you know, the number on this node. So only if n plus k is smaller than m, then I'll change his label. So he's going to stay yellow, but I'm going to change him to, um, uh, to m plus k, only if that makes his, his n decrease. Does that make sense? Because I've now found a shorter path to this yellow node. That's the intuition. So these ends, once I put an n on a node, it's only going to go down. Right, I'm never going to increase it. That's an important intuition. 
because I, uh, once I found a path of length n to um, uh, a vertex, for a, a path of length n from A to the vertex, then I might find shorter paths, but I, I'd never want to give up on the one I've got. Oh. And finally, if it's green, well, all I said about green was that it's passive. Maybe m is not yet the shortest path. It turns out that it is production, but in general it's not going to be. So if, again, if um, m must get shorter, then I again can reduce it. Okay? And that's it. That's what tell the neighbors means. So it's a sort of one-step propagation. It says, I'm turning v green, let me take the immediate neighbors and drop their, uh, their numbers if necessary and turn them all yellow. And, oh, turn them, oh, that's right. If this guy's green, I turn him back to yellow if I've shrunk his number so that I look at him again so he can shrink his neighbors and so forth. But if, he, if this condition didn't hold, he will stay green. That's fine. Okay? So far so good. That's it. That's Dijkstra's that article. Now, uh, let's, just see. let's just see it working. Is there any questions so far? Do you, do you think you understand? Yes? It gives you an estimate of the, of the shortest distance to a node, but then how do you turn that into a path to get to the node that you Oh, raised? well, so if we had a complete path, or so if we found B, if we got to this point, when B is green, right, then we would say, then we would know, B would say, oh, there's a path of length 42 to B, right? And then you would say, hmm, I wonder um, which node of the nodes that arrive at B is the, the previous one, right? You could say, oh, so you look at their labels, right, and one of them at least will say, uh, let's say it's of length 4, he'll say 38, right, with he's sort of 4 less than B. So you can, you can find your way back. But then how do you, if, if, there's, if you've got five neighbours of, of B, how do you find which one is the actual one that is on the path? Well, it doesn't matter. If there were several, so let me see. So I've got B, um, uh, and he's got, let's say, 45 on him. Right, so we know that there is a path of length 45. And then some way connected to here is a node, let's say this is 2. And this says 43, oh. and this says 7. And this guy says uh, 38. Um, well, now, the shortest path could go through either of these two, actually, because if you go this way, well, there's a path of 43, and that will give me a 45, and if I go this way, there's a path of, see what I mean? So actually, it doesn't matter. You can always find by, by this. Once you know the number, once you know the numbers, you're gone. Okay? So Good question. Yeah. So with the turning green back into yellow, yeah. so that can only happen if the vertices can have negative weights, right? No, no, green back into yellow. This can happen because he got to be green because I somehow found a node by some path and you know some rather long path, right? So he got a big green number, right? Oh. So now he's passive. But then I found some shorter way. But we only turn the lowest number to green, right? So it could never ah, actually happen. Ah, true. In Dijkstra's algorithm, this never happens. In Dijkstra's algorithm. But I'm putting, it, I'm putting it this way because if it did happen, this is what we want to do, and in future versions of the algorithm, we will want this to happen. But if that does happen, then doesn't that mean we'll have to stop if everything becomes green? Because then you could always turn yeah, it back yeah, into yeah. yellow. Yeah, so you can worry about it. You know, if, if this can happen, now I think you're green from yellow, and how do I know I've only got the shortest path? We're going to come to all of that. If it's not obvious, you get the right answer. Right? So we have to reason about, does this algorithm even terminate? And does it give the right answer when it terminates? And we're going to talk about that. Yeah. So, it's absolutely not obvious that this algorithm works. That's maybe the point. So, I'm not, sometimes, somebody tells you the algorithm, of course, yeah, I understand that, right? Here you think, hmm, maybe, maybe, and we're going to prove it. Um, now, so let's just execute it first, get an intuition for how it works. So we start with zero, well, they're all red, except this guy that's yellow. Um, we're going to turn in green and um, choose uh, one of these guys, one yellow node, oh, sorry, we're going to turn in green and tell the neighbors. What did tell the neighbors mean? It meant take a red node and make it 0 plus k, 0 plus 10, 10, 0 plus 15, 15. Now we're going to pick one of these nodes, let's say randomly this one, any, any yellow node will do. Or oh, sorry, the yellow node with the smallest n. 15 and 10, pick 10. Right? So now we're going to pick him with the smallest n and we're going to turn in green and tell his neighbors. To tell his neighbors, what does that mean? We're going to turn these two yellow and what numbers are we going to, we're going to put in both of these? 11, right? Because we, we just add 1 to our 10. So he, he's 11, right? So now we pick the, the smallest, the uh, node with smallest, um, yellow node with smallest n. Either of these 11s will do, but let's pick this one. So we're going to turn his neighbors 
We're going to now um, you know, tell his neighbors. He's got lots of neighbors, right? He's got a green one over here. I didn't mention that before. So he goes back here. Would 11 plus 1, 12? That wouldn't reduce his number, so we don't change him. This guy, 11 plus 4 makes 15, so we don't touch him. 11 plus 3 makes 14, yeah, so we're going to make him uh, go to 14, right? So how's it going? Okay, so now the smallest yellow number that's this chap. So we expand him, he tells his neighbors, oh, so we've got to make him 15. The uh, smallest one is this 14. Uh, so we um, add 8 to this and make him 22. Uh, notice this is, the de this is the destination, that's B. So B has turned yellow now, but it may or may not be the shortest path. He's not green yet. So what happens now? He's the smallest guy, this 15. So we turn uh, him yellow and add 8 to get 23. And now we're going to um, uh, turn, um, what are we going to do? Um, um, oh, now he's the smallest one, right? He's the smallest yellow note. B is the smallest yellow note. So we can turn him green. And we've won. Right? The sort of choice part of 22. That's how the algorithm works. Okay. Well, uh, so this is your question, right? It kind of worked in this example, but does it work in every example? Every single example. And how would you know for sure? Well, let's see, the, the first things we might ask about this one is, uh, let's see, does it even terminate? Um, let's see, can you make a termination argument? How, could this go on forever? Here it is. Anybody care to uh, uh, try to explain to a you know, random person why this could go on forever? Yeah. Because the num number of green nodes increases, and if we don't uh, turn them yellow again, they will, we will run out of green nodes. Right, right. So uh, um, at the moment, in every step, um, uh, a um, red node becomes yellow. A yellow node might stay yellow, so maybe we're not making progress there. But and a green, and as you say, uh, um, a, um, let's say this doesn't happen. In fact, we can prove it actually doesn't happen. So yellows can still become yellows. So, um, uh, but in every step I turn one, that's right, so in every step I turn one yellow node green and I never turn the green node back to yellow, we're still allowed to prove why that can't happen. So therefore we will turn, that's a good, that's a good argument, yeah. Why don't we turn a yellow node back, why don't we ever turn a green node back? Because we always pick the lowest end, how could we possibly um, turn a, uh, this node was yellow, right? And if this node was previously yellow as well, then if, when we turn this one green, um, we'll, uh, uh, we would have picked this one. It was going to um, get to be a... Uh, um, oh, did I get this right? Uh, sorry, yes, it, I, think, I think if you think about it for two minutes, I'm not going to pause here because I've got too, too much else I want to say, but I think the, the argument that says yellow nodes, the green nodes don't turn yellow is pretty straightforward. Okay. So then the termination algorithm is very straight, very easy. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I'm about to make a mistake of thinking that was, uh, that was very easy. It's not entirely obvious because I was focusing my attention on the, the harder question of how do we know that you get the shortest path? Because after all, when we finish all of this game, we have not even explored all the nodes. Oh, actually, in this particular example, we have. We have looked at everything. But it's easy to see that there are examples where you, there are some things you do not look at at all, right? And yet, we terminate. This was terminate as soon as B becomes green. There are certainly still yellow nodes. And when we finish, here we are. This is green. There are some yellow nodes unprocessed, but we know somehow that they're not going to be relevant. How do we know that? Which order of the parts? It's not what? In this case, it's because in 23 plus 8, that will be bigger, right? But how do we know that will always, always, always be true? Yeah. Uh, they are the maximum of all the The maximum? The maximum of all the nodes. The maximum of all the nodes. The maximum of all the nodes is what? Then two. The maximum of all, well, that, that in, in this particular example, this is the biggest number here, 22 here, so we're not going to, there is a 23 path to here, but we're not going to not go through there to find a shorter path to B, definitely. But how can we be sure that was true for every road network in the whole of Europe? We explore all the paths that are shorter than 22 visible. We've somehow explored all the paths that are shorter than 23. So, yeah, yeah. We're exploring every path that doesn't involve a cycle. To get to that well, no, we're not. Even exploring every path that doesn't involve a cycle. You'll find that if you do this on big maps, you can explore from A to B, and there are paths that there are no cycles involved, that are just off to the side. 
but never get looked at. No. Making the next step would be more expensive than the, the solution we found? Taking the next step would be more expensive than the solution. Like, that's what we want to kind of formalize. So, so what I want to do in one slide is to give you an argument that I think you could you know, convince your daughter that this always, always works. And it's not, it, it, it turns out, I, I scoured the literature for this, it's not easy to find. If you Google around for proofs of Dutch, it's not, they're not done. You know, easy, easy to find. Certainly for ACE, but this proof I chose because a proof of Dijkstra's algorithm, they're not too hard to find. But this proof scales to work for A star as well, which I'm about to show you. And those proofs are thinner on the ground. And so I boiled this proof down to the simplest essence I could. So let's see if I can convince you. OK, so now you really have to pay attention. Are you ready? Are you ready? So the question is, I'm going to stop when B turns green. So the question is, could B turn green prematurely? That is, uh, uh, before I've you know, looked at enough nodes, and when it does turn green, does it have the right number in it? And I'm going to try to demonstrate that could not be the case. Right? I'll do it like this. Imagine that you knew the optimal path from A to B. That is the shortest path from A to B. I've just drawn it here. Right? You know, the computer doesn't know that, but we kind of, in some, in some in our minds, do know it. Now, now, at some stage in the algorithm, when B is, you know, we're, we're thinking about whether B might turn green. At some stage in the algorithm, um, there are going to be some green nodes. A will definitely be green, we, because it was the yellow node to start with, and we turned it green, right, the very first step, right, with zero in it. So, there's some sequence of green nodes, I mean, clearly, perhaps a little length one, but maybe longer. There's some sequence of green nodes, after which I get to a yellow or perhaps a red. Actually, green nodes are always attached to yellow nodes only, or green nodes, they're never attached to red nodes. I think that's fine. Yes, because when I turn it green, I flip the red off. So, so at some point on a path, if I start at A and follow this optimal path, the shortest path, I will go green, 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 and at some point I will get to yellow. If I didn't, green, 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 all the way to the end, then uh, I would have got to my destination. Okay, at some point I'm going to get to yellow. Now, I want to, think, I want to claim two things. The first is that even for yellow nodes, for every yellow node, or actually indeed every green node, if it says yellow K, there is a K path, not necessarily the shortest, but the existence, you know, this guy says there is a path of length 15 to this node. Possibly not the shortest path, but there is a path of length 15. That's what yellow K means. There is a K path. From A to B, yes. So here, since this guy has K, I know there is a path of length K, a path of length K that gets to B. Right? I know that for sure. I think, are you convinced of that? Now, going back to this thing, I've got my initial, uh, my initial list. Now, here's a claim. All of these green nodes have the correct end. By correct end, I mean the shortest path from A to the node. So this guy says zero. This guy, uh, the shortest path is seven. The shortest path is 10. The shortest path is 11. They will have the correct number. Why will? These initial sequence of green nodes, however long it is, maybe only of length one, maybe longer, why do we know that they all must have the correct M, the shortest path from A to that vertex? Yeah? Because if there would have been another one, we would have looked at that first, and that would have been a big one. Yeah, right. So, if, if it, you know, so imagine when I turned this green, when I turned it green, um, I you know, told this guy, I, I, I made sure that this guy's number was, when I turned this green, I made sure that this guy's number was no more than seven. When I turned this guy green, I made this guy's number no more than 10. When I turned this guy green, I made sure that his number was no more than 11. <coughs> okay? So, although, remember, this is a thought experiment, you know, if we are thinking about the optimal path, we do know that on the optimal path, all these numbers up to here are correct. With me so far? After this point, who knows? Okay, so now the question before us is will the algorithm, will Dijkstra's algorithm choose this guy or this guy? Or maybe something else. If he could possibly choose this guy, we're in trouble. Right? So I want to make sure that he is always going to choose this guy over this guy. Or something else. He, must, he mustn't choose B, because then B would turn green and would be dead. How do we know he's going to choose this? Well, since all of these guys have the correct number, when we turned him green, 
he, the one hop away from this green guy, he also has the correct number. The, the shortest path to him is 15. This chap, we don't know. These, chap, these chaps, we don't know. This chap, definitely 15. Yes? Because when we turned him green, we made sure that his number was no more than 15. And since 15 is the shortest path, it'll be 15. Okay. Now, um, so we know that. Um, uh, but this short, this, so that's the shortest path from A to B. But we have some distance left to go. So the shortest path from A to B is surely less than this. Unless B is B. Right? So we know that 15 must be shorter than, must be smaller than, the shortest path all the way to B. So that's the reason. Here we are. We, you know, we've got this path, the shortest path. We've got 15 steps. And we've got more to go. So 15 is shorter than the shortest path to all the way to B. But K is bigger than the shortest path all the way to B. Because there is a path from A to B of length K, and the shortest path, and we can't get shorter than that. Right? So K is bigger than the shortest path. This is smaller than the shortest path, so I'm sure to choose the him over him. Right? So what that tells us is I can't possibly turn the destination green until I have turned every vertex on the optimal path green. And if I had turned every vertex on the optimal path green, then in that final step, right, when I turn this guy green for the last time, I will, be, I will turn him yellow with the correct distance. Are you convinced? Mm -hmm. Don't think that's a nice argument? I don't have to talk, talk much about induction. It's just a, it's just a, you know? Yeah. So, so this is a good moment to pause because it's a, you know, something intellectually interesting has happened in this book. <laughs> And for me, this is what computer science is about. It says, ah, oh, I can write this code, and I know always nobody will submit a bug report because the algorithm, they might, I might have implemented it wrong, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Okay. Good? That's it. So, um, uh, okay, so, so far so good, except that it does work, but it doesn't work very well. Uh, it explores far too many roads. Here is a map of the Pacific Northwest. Um, and uh, which is, so this is sort of Seattle, um, and this is somewhere down in the middle of the, um, you know, the country of the, the United States. And in going from here to here, Deutsche explored all of these roads down here, but what a ridiculous thing to do, right? <laughs> why would you even think of exploring roads down here? I'm going to explain why it's not as stupid as it looks, but nevertheless, it is stupid. Okay, so that's that. Okay, so what are we going to do? One simple idea is to start, maybe we could work from both ends at once, right? So sort of work out from here and backwards from here. That's called bi-directional structure. It's a fairly simple extension, and you get this. You have to be even more careful with your implementation. It's not really quite a simple problem. But you still explore vastly more roads than any rational human being would say. If I gave you a map to, I want to go from here to here, you would not get the map out through this part of the country. Right? You just wouldn't. But something is wrong. Okay. So, this is where we got to. And Astra died in 2002, sadly. It's just an amazing computer society. had a lot of very intellectually interesting ideas. This was just one of them. Um, and uh, so we're sort of up to, up to here in our story. Great, great man. I, I got to meet him too. He was at a workshop in um, Newcastle, strangely enough. Okay, <laughs> so now um, so now I'm going to step back a bit and say, okay, so uh, while well, I'm just doing Dijkstra, I want to show you a slight generalization of Dijkstra um, that does what looks like something worse, but we can soup it up to do something better. So here, as a reminder, is Dijkstra's algorithm, right? And the bit I've circled here is look for the vertex with the smallest ends. What we're going to do is, everything about the algorithms I'm going to show you is going to be the same, except my criterion for which element of the work list is going to change. Here I'm picking the one with smallest end. <coughs> That's what Dijkstra does. Um, now, the generalization <coughs> works like this. This is a super general version. This is the other end of the spectrum, which says instead of picking uh, the version with smallest end, pick any work list node. Any of them at all, right? Uh, and then, as before, we make it green and we tell the neighbors. 
But now, because we didn't pick the one with the smallest n, now we could get some green nodes turning back into yellow ones. So now, this thing does happen. Um, and the other thing is that when we get to B, so when a node turns green in Dijkstra's algorithm, we know that its n is final, right? Since we don't turn it back to yellow, we have no further opportunity to reduce its number. So you can see from our algorithm so far, when it turns green, it stays green. The, the n you get for a green node, that's the final version, right? With this algorithm, if you think about it for a little bit, you'll, you'll find that you could quickly draw some graphs that show you. You could um, pick a yellow node, you can turn something green, and then you find another route, and you go back and say, that, that green, that said green, but actually it's smaller. I can find a faster route to the same place because of the any. So the, the stopping condition has to be more complicated. The stopping condition here is when B is green and there are no yellow nodes that have a shorter path. Right? Somebody mentioned that. Right? Do you remember you, somebody said, oh, but look, that, one is, that yellow node is 23. So you couldn't possibly find a faster route to the destination. That's what's going on here. And then this method will, will work. Right? So this is worse in the sense that it looks as if uh, nodes could go from, um, uh, let's see, do I say this? No, no, nodes can turn from, from yellow to green. Oh, so from green back to yellow. That's bad. So I might visit nodes more than once. That sounds inefficient. And also, my stopping condition is more complicated. That doesn't sound so good. But it gives us some more wiggle room. Right? It gives us more wiggle room because it says, oh, I don't have to choose Dijkstra's choice. And we're going to have better choices. But this is called the scanning method. It's a sort of generic. It's, it's, it, it, it covers a, a range of algorithms. And I'm going to explore the range by, instead of choosing truly any randomly, I'm going to make a different strategic choice, not Dijkstra's choice, but a more cunning one. But the tell the neighbors thing is unchanged. So the only thing that's changed is my choice of So the same, the point is that the same, the algorithm wasn't predicated on choosing the smallest one. Actually, the, you know, with a very small tweak, it works just fine in terms of correctness, not necessarily efficiency, for uh, other choices in here. Okay? So that's the. Uh, okay. Now, uh, but you might wonder look, um, does this algorithm even terminate? After all, uh, nodes are going from uh, green to yellow, and yellow to green, and green to yellow, and yellow to green. Could that go on forever? I think, can you make an argument that says that couldn't possibly go on forever? The what? what? None of which change? Oh, the argument to yellow. That's right, the number. That's right, the numbers on the nodes, I only go from green to yellow, if the number decreases, in fact, in every step, numbers decrease, right? So you can, you know, you may visit nodes many times, but in each stage, every node has a number that decreases. So we're gone, right? Or else the node goes from yellow to green. So that's a good termination argument. It may take longer, because you may visit nodes n times rather than just once, but it will terminate. It's a little bit less obvious to see why it terminates with the shortest path. And I'm not going to. I'm not going to do that. You can adapt the one I showed you, but I'm going to. I want to show you a star, which I can show you. It's it's um, more fun. Okay. But this is actually a uh, a correct algorithm. It's just a bit inefficient if you randomly choose. But the nice thing is that once you know that it'll work if you randomly choose, then for any any choice, if I then go from this and instead of choosing any random yellow vertex, I just choose a particular one somehow, then I know that it's all. Okay. Now. Uh, I've said this already. Um, uh, two, Dutch have two advantages over this, which is that he stops, he doesn't, he visits any, any vertex once, and he stops when um, uh, B becomes green, rather than this more complicated stopping condition here. Okay, so that's the, that's the general setup. Now, um, let's see, why did Dutch behave badly? Right? Why was he not doing, really not doing very well? And it's because he does ink blocks, right? Remember, he chooses the yellow node that is closest to, not the destination, but the starting point, right? So imagine if I can inbox, we start here, the green nodes are the one we've done, we've got a sort of yellow boundary, we choose the yellow node that's closest to the starting point and look outwards from there. So I'm driving from London to, to Birmingham, but I inkblot my way out and I start going towards Croydon, and then, you know, towards Brighton. Why would I do that? Because I choose that closest end, right? What a stupid thing to do, I'm going completely the opposite direction than the one I'm trying to go with, but that's what I've just done. He in blocks his way out, right, like this. Um, make sense? Uh, that's why things don't work very well. Of course, if you in block from two directions at once, then the blocks meet each other more quickly, that's good. 
But the basic idea is stupid, right? That he leaked that. So that's <laughs> obviously wrong. But why is it not completely stupid? And it's because this. Supposing I was here, and I ink blot in my way out, and then here, it turned out there was a space warp that could instantaneously take me over here. Now it would make sense, instead of laboriously going down here, to go out this way, zoom, right, and then... Or maybe, maybe this space warp took me all the way to the destination. There's no way to tell, for sure, right? This is just a graph with weights on the vertices. So I sort of have to go towards Brighton just in case there is an incredibly fast motorway from Brighton <laughs> to London. <laughs> right? But there isn't. <laughs> so, the, 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 the question is, how could we exploit our knowledge of how fast vehicles could travel, right, to, um, uh, to speed up this search? Really dramatic. I mean, it's really dramatically bad, this. Look at the roads. Every little neighborhood in little hamlets down here is being it's ridiculous, right? So how could we use our domain knowledge to fix that in a way that wasn't totally specific to, you know, maps, right? But we still like some level of abstraction. That was the, that now we get to something that Dutch, that, well, that, that these guys, um, uh, uh, um, what was his name? Um, I forget the A-star guy's name. Oh, Nilsson and co. thought of. They were trying to do route planning for a robot. So they had a robot and it was trying to find its way around mazes and things. So that was their problem, and they invented an algorithm called A star. So here's the difference between A star and Dijkstra. Dijkstra's algorithm, we've seen it lots of times. Choose the other name with the smallest step. That is the one closest to the beginning, which, as we've been discussing, is not a good idea. So what they did instead is they said, choose the yellow vertex with the smallest n plus l. What's this l thing? L is a lower bound on the distance from v to the destination. A lower bound. Right, so that says, if I, I'm thinking about um, uh, a place that I, you know, a yellow node I might choose, then I think, uh, let's say it's in, um, um, you know, Milton Keynes. What's a lower bound on the distance between Milton Keynes and Birmingham? Maybe, you know, the fastest motorway possible. Right? And then I say, oh, I could go to Croydon. Should I choose that node? What's a lower bound on the distance from Croydon to Birmingham? Actually, you know, th th there is a, you we, we, can, we can make a sensible lower bound. Maybe draw a straight line and the fastest possible car. That would do with my lower bound to begin with. Okay? So, in real problems, it is possible to have lower bounds for the bit we have not yet explored, for the distance from the node I'm looking at, V, to the destination. <coughs> the distance from V to B, a lower bound of that. Okay? So, this is the main knowledge. I mean, it, it, you know, to do with maps and in, in a different application, it would be different. But, so, these, guys, these A star guys said, if we have this function L, then we could do better. All right? Now, how can we do better? Well, uh, well, first of all, just know that if L of V, the lower bound, is zero, well, that's surely a lower bound. You can't go faster than instantaneously. So if you choose L of V to zero, what do you get? Mm -hmm. Dijkstra, right? So Dijkstra is a sort of extreme of this algorithm with a particularly simple lower bound. Right? It's a special case. So this, this is a sort of superset of Dijkstra that just does something more right. So uh, I'm going to tell you what uh, L is, but let me just first of all point out, tell the neighbors, no change. Node can still turn from green back to yellow, however, right? Unlike Dijkstra. But nevertheless, the, the, the algorithm is, is, the only change is this. But notice also, I've gone back to saying stop when B becomes green. That was good, all right? I don't have to do that more complicated stopping condition. Okay, so uh, let's see. Let's just see how this goes. Supposing I want to go from London to Troon. Troon is a town near Glasgow where I used to live. Um, now, um, and supposing I've already been watching, I've already explored, you know, some direction. I've already explored as far as Birmingham and Brighton. Um, and I've sort of, been, you know, I've done some, they're yellow. So I know that there is a path of length 100 to Brighton. I know there is a path of length 120 to Birmingham. Okay, now what? Uh, should, I ex should I explore more than Birmingham or more than Brighton? Well, Dijkstra would say, oh, Brighton looks good to me. <laughs> right? He's only 100 from London, so better explore from there, right? Birmingham, but Birmingham looks good to me. Don't you think it looks good to you? Right? Which map would you get at? 
And why is that? Because if I look at the crow flies estimate, it's 650 miles from Brighton to Chu, only 400 from Birmingham. So 120 plus 400 makes 520. 100 plus 650, 750. Oh, let's do Birmingham. That's what A star says. Okay? That is the idea. Pretty simple, actually. And, and kind of intuitively, you could see why. Because he's saying, uh, you know, explore the one that is for which the, the, the best estimate we have of the total distance is minimal. All right? That's a good intuition. You know, that the, you, you don't know for sure, but prioritize yellow nodes that appear to be, you know, on the route that is in total shortest, not just shortest so far, which is what Blight is, the shortest so far. This guy looks like the shortest level. Okay, that's your intuition. Anchor that. Yeah. So how do I, without exploring all the different nodes, know as the crow flies? Like, oh, like, how do I? Well, well, so I do need. So so how do I get this? With, so I definitely don't use the nodes at all. I just this. Is, so I have to assume that there's some domain knowledge, right? So if you're the map person, you just draw the straight line on the map and measure it. You know the geographical positions of these places, right? You're the map person. Right, so I do, like, in the map case, I would annotate my notes with, like, x, y, coordinates. That's right, yes, yes, yeah. so for the crow flies, this is that. We're going to annotate them in a different way, very shortly. Yeah, so it is information that is strictly not part of the original graph, right, because the original graph just didn't have enough information because it could have had one of those wormholes through space. This is the extra information that's telling us where those wormholes could possibly be. Yeah. So it's strictly extra. Strictly extra storage, strictly extra knowledge that you're putting in. Yeah. Okay. So far so good? All right. Now, uh, we have to wonder whether this, whether this gives the correct answer. And it turns out that it only gives the correct answer if the lower bound estimate is sensible. And by sensible, I mean the following. Firstly, the, the, um, the lower bound from uh, uh, how long does it take to get from B to B? Zero. So L of B should be zero. That's the lower bound from B to B. Now, and also it should respect the triangle inequality. And what does that mean? That means that if I got from V to B, the distance from V to B that L tells me, had better be smaller than for every other node W, if I've got L at W and V is directly connected to W, if I add on this bit and then estimate this, it should be smaller than or equal to this. Uh, greater than or equal to this, sorry. This, the direct path should be shorter. That's called the triangle inequality. And you can see that a good lower bound estimate should respect that, right? Just common sense. And this is a good way of formalizing common sense. Um, the crow flies distance certainly has that property. Okay? So that's why I say L is a sensible lower bound thing. Um, so, and it turns out that if it respects the triangle inequality, then it also has the property that it's, um, the lower bound is, small, is uh, less than the shortest path. Okay, so it really is a lower bound for the actual distance along the roads. Right, and that's what we so this, this property is super important. In fact, that's really all you need is, is to know this. Okay? All right. Fine. So now, now I'm going to replay the argument about why. So, so A star is just amazing. Right? How could it possibly be sure to give the right answer just when B turns green, right? Uh, here. That was amazing. We've explored many fewer parts, as you will see. Um, well. Uh, here's the same argument as I gave you for Dijkstra. I shan't replay it at the same length, but the very same argument works. Could B turn green prematurely? Well, consider the optimal path, and this is K. There is a K path from B that must be bigger than the shortest path, right? Because the shortest path, well, because K is a path, and there's no path that's shorter than the shortest path. The initial green nodes um, all have the correct end, exactly the same reasoning as before. So V has the correct end, and now the only difference in the argument is that V's n plus the lower bound of V must, so it must be shorter than the shortest path from A to B. Why? Well, because the distance from A to V is, um, that is n, n is the distance from A to V, the shorter, and, and the distance from V to B, it must be, uh, you know, n is a lower bound from that. So surely it is shorter than the shortest path. On the other hand, k, as you remember, um, um, uh, k is bigger than the shortest path. This is shorter than the smallest path, so again, we can be sure that we'll choose this one before this one, and that's it. 
So I really like it that the same argument works. This argument is the one that's given in the A star paper, which is uh, not the one I cited in the, in the abstract, I cited as a later one, but it, it's one of the citations of the paper that I gave you in the, um, in the abstract. Uh, it's the original A star paper, which is only eight pages long, and quite now, you, you know, any of you could read it easily. It's not, it's not heavy duty. Uh, it's really nice to read. Okay. So, this is the argument. I, I, you know, I'm not belaboring it, but it's the same argument as the Dijkstra, and it still proves that A star finds the shortest path. Sadly, however, it still does not work well. It works better than Dijkstra, but still not well. And why? Because motorways are a bit like spacewalks. Right? How do you know a lower bound for the, uh, for the distance between Birmingham and Scotland or, and, and True? Well, you might have special knowledge, but the simplest thing to do is to say, what's the fastest car on the fastest road? Right? So once you have motorways, you sort of have to assume that um, you know, the, crow, the, um, uh, the crow flying at the fastest motorway speed is, is what you're after. Right? And so that means that the crow flies distance that we have to do is rather small. Right? The lower bounds are rather small. We want big lower bounds, right? We got a lower bound of zero is back to Dijkstra. We want a bigger lower bound, and motorways or very fast roads shrink that lower bound. So it's not really good. Um, so even one, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, that, that's where we are. Now these are the chaps. Hart, Raphael, Nilsson. Amazing. Um, amazing piece of engineering. Very nice. It's an ingenious um, What we want to do is to have better lower bounds than Euclidean distance crow flies. So now we're moving on to 2005 or so. So we're into the current millennium now. Um, we, we've hopped over this quite long gap, you know, 1968, is this 1968? So 30 years, nothing much happened. And now we're gonna hop over to um, uh, what happened in the early 2000s when people started doing seriously big graphs for serious group planning on how <coughs> So the picture I want to give you is that there's this lower bound thing, right, L of V. So L of V is a lower bound from the distance from V to the destination B. If the lower bound is zero, which is certainly definitely a lower bound, we get Dijkstra. The, the largest possible value that L of V could have would be the exact distance for, from V to V. If we were omniscient and knew the precise distance from V to V, what would happen? So if we made L of B somehow omnisciently be the exact right distance, we would always pick exactly the right node. We would look at exactly one node all the way. That's what would happen if we were clever, clever enough to go right up to the... There's a sort of slider here. This is really bad. Better, 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 better. This is impossible because we don't know the exact distance. This is what we're trying to figure out, right? Okay, so what can we do? So, um, Dijkstra here is inkblotting. Um, he does this, uh, inkblots his way. Uh, now, if we have a better lower bound, we get a sort of more biased thing, right? Because he's dragging towards B, right? And he inkblots his way in a more cleverly biased way by having L and B up here. Um, if, on the other hand, L and B was right up here, we'd zoom straight, right, down the shortest path. So I want to get, I want you to have the feeling of this continuum of algorithms driven by the goodness of L of V, right? And Euclidean distance along the fastest motorway is a possible one, but not a very good one. And now I'm going to show you a very simple and very clever idea that Andrew Goldberg and his colleagues invented that gives much better results. Are you ready? <laughs> yes. It's amazing. <laughs> Called landmarks. So here's the idea. Pick a few landmarks, sort of around the edge of your map, right? Pre-compute exact distances from every node to the landmark. So let's say the landmark is Glasgow. Then for every intersection in Britain, indeed in Europe, I'm going to compute an exact distance to Glasgow, and I'm going to record that for posterity. So I'm going to, for every node, remember I've got its geographical location and a few other things, I'm just going to add one number, the distance to Glasgow. <coughs> Right? That's not so much extra storage, it's a few megabytes or you know, a few tens of megabytes, it's nothing much, you know, fits on a tiny corner of a USB stick. So I'm going to pre and, and what, what, I'm going to do this once. So once in the history of the universe, but then go along, right? So it's, it's all about to compute all these things, but once it's done, it's done. Now, so supposing I know that, 
Now, to compute a lower bound for the distance from Brighton to Troon, what can I do? Well, big one. You sum the two paths to one landmark. Uh, yes, well, um, uh, right, yes, so if I knew that, so the, I know the exact distance from um, Brighton to Glasgow, and I know the exact distance from Brighton to Troon, so at least, um, let's see, I want a lower bound. So I don't want to add them, because that, there might be a shorter way. If Troon was sort of you know, on the way to Glasgow, then the distance might be less than 653, right? Um, but even if Troon was exactly on the way, Troon could not possibly be closer than... Oh, I should have 647, right? It couldn't be, couldn't be less than 16 miles less. All right? Mm -hmm. So isn't that good, right? So I pre-computed it. And this, by the way, is taking account of all the intersections and the motorways and traffic jams, who knows what, all of stuff is taking account of this number and this number. And now I've got a lower bound on the way to true. Okay? Traffic jams are dynamic. Big one? Traffic jams. Are Traffic's a dynamic. Very good point. So if you really want to take account of traffic jams, you would have to compute these exact shortest paths on a regular basis. So I'm not going to deal with that at all. And probably the guys at Google have thought quite hard about that. But that's <laughs> And, and Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Goldberg, it does work for Microsoft. Um, so, now, um, <coughs> let's see. Um, uh, the, um, this all rather relies on the fact that the Troon is near Glasgow, right? If Troon was in the opposite direction, it wouldn't help much. All right? So, it's quite helpful to have several landmarks, a dozen or so, pre compute them all. Um, and, uh, and then, then we notice just what I said, that the, 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 if the landmark is the other side of the destination, so here's the landmark, here's where I, I am. So if it's the other side of the destination, then my lower bound is quite a good one. But if it's nowhere near the destination, that's not the low, low bound. is still the lower bound, but it's not a good one. So uh, um, how can we find, um, how can we always have a, a landmark that's beyond the destination? Well, a simple way is to choose several of them, right? So if I have lots of landmarks, like say 10, around the edge of my map, then there's always going to be one of them that is beyond the destination, sort of, you know, roughly. It doesn't have to be exact, somewhat beyond. And the point is that if I have a lower bound from one that's driven from one landmark and a lower bound that's driven from a second landmark, they're all lower bounds. So I can take the maximum of them. Remember, I want the largest lower bound. So I take the maximum of all these lower bounds. And I'm good, and that's amazing. And so if, it's provided one of them is in a good place, we're happy, right? Um, and that's really it. Don't you think that was a simple idea? Well, that means I need to compute, if I compute ten, got 10 landmarks, I need 10 numbers for every student intersection in Europe. But it makes an amazing difference. <coughs> this is the direction, my directional direction. This is the thing with landmarks. The landmarks are the, the um, spots. I don't know why some are yellow and some are red. Um, but look at how few, and this is a bi-directional version of this um, A star with landmarks algorithm. Look how many fewer nodes are explored. You know, nothing down here, nothing up here. Just transformationally different. Don't you think that's amazing? And that one simple pre so space-time trade-off, we've taken a little bit of space, but we gained an awful lot of time. So how's it good? Um, okay, uh, so uh, there's some numbers to it that you know, goes from uh, Running time goes from uh, a third of a second, 340 milliseconds, 12 milliseconds. If, you're, if you manage to optimize your programs by that factor, you would be happy, right? <laughs> Very happy. That's a big number. And this is not done by clever engineering of the inner loops. This is done by having a better algorithm. Okay, so here we go. Now, uh, can we do better still? So I'm going to, in the last few minutes, I have, so, so we, we started at 10 past, right? Yes. So can I go? Yeah, yeah. Can I just give, can I just give you ten? Oh, so I mean, my whole life's been building up to this point. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't stop there. This is 2002, so I'm going to show you one one idea very quickly. So I won't do this in detail because I barely understand it myself. But it just I want to give you an idea of what people are, are, are trying to do now. So this is here's a map um, in which here's your starting point, here's your finishing point, and it turns out this is the Bay Area, and there's this little island here which is. Uh, implausibly enough, actually called Treasure Island. This is a real place. I didn't make it up. Um, now, of course, I could explore, when, when doing routes from A to B, I could explore Treasure Island, but you would not sensibly do that. Because your intuition is that Treasure Island is not really on the way to anywhere, is it? 
right? It's only on the way to itself. How could we incorporate that idea, right? What? No vertex in Treasure Island is sort of on the way to anywhere distant. What might that mean? So, uh, that doesn't mean, it might be on the way between somewhere close, right? If this was your A and this was your B, that is on the way between them. So it's not, it's not on the way to anywhere, it's just not on the way of distant places, right? And on the way means on the shortest path. So how might I um, uh, it, uh, express that more formally? Well, um, uh, Andrew and his colleagues, I'm not sure whether it was originally, had invented this idea of reach. So the reach of a vertex is the, intuitively it's big if V is on the way, that is on the shortest path, between distant places, and the reach of V is small if V is only on the way between nearby places. All right? So you could put it like this. The reach of it is the maximum of take any two vertices, take any two vertices, find the shortest path between them, um, and, and, have, and try all the shortest path in which V is on. So if V is on the shortest path between A and B, right, now look for the shortest path from V to A and from V to B, that is to see if the, the endpoints are near V. And the largest one, that's the, that's the reach, right, that says the most distant one, so I'm on the way between, you said that's its reach. That's the intuition. I want to be, I'm on the way between far away places. So at least one of A and B is far away. That's what reach is. Now, computing this, computing the reach of V, you do that once and for all, and it's expensive. It's really expensive. But if you knew the reach of V, then you could modify our same scanning algorithm again in, when by choosing the yellow vertex, instead of choosing it with the smallest N plus L of V, we filter out all of those for which the reach of V, remember the reach says, if the reach of V is smaller than N, that means that no shortest path involving V can be as distant as N. But we know that we're going from a place that's N away, so V can't be on the shortest path. And similarly, if his, if his reach of V is a bit smaller than L, of, uh, the lower bound here, we can't be on the shortest path. So we can filter out all of those guys and just not look at them. So again, uh, pre-compute reach, and then use it to filter out the scenario. And this makes a big difference too. Uh, here is the same thing. This is without reach, <coughs> and this is with reach. Look, it's sort of, it's barely look at anything. These little green spots are from one direction, and the blue spots are the bi-directional thing from the other direction. It's, it's, it's looking at incredibly few vertices. It's <coughs> quite amazing. There's a bit of, there's another piece in here, there's a sort of shortcut business in here that I haven't talked about. Uh, I think I should wrap up. I just want to uh, uh, point. We've gone from 340 milliseconds now to 0.73 milliseconds by a bit of pre computation and algorithmic cleverness. That is a huge one. Okay. Um, and that's not all, right? So, since these guys wrote the paper, and this is, the, this is in, incidentally the paper that I, not the reach part, but the landmark stuff, was the paper that I um, uh, uh, put in the, the link. Here it is. It's quite a nice paper. I think you could enjoy reading it. There's this other thing about contraction hierarchies that, you know, is. is uh, since then, and there's, there's more papers in 2011, 2012. This stuff is still burgeoning, amazingly, even though it's a you know, 60 year old problem. I think that's incredible. We're still finding ways of making this faster, a lot faster. Um, so here's my, my sort of wrap up is just to say look, you know, um, uh, here, here's an algorithm that's kind of uh, very simple to describe what the problem is that we're trying to solve. The algorithms themselves, certainly their initial versions, are not that complicated. The argument that the algorithms work is definitely an intellectual challenge. It's not just obvious. Right? Um, the amount of win that you get by taking a clever algorithm is enormous, not just you know, modest. Um, and uh, you know, uh, the key to getting hold of all of this, if you thought of it in terms of the original root map, your head would explode. The key to doing all this is abstraction. So uh, this is uh, you know, <laughs> computer science, just the most amazing subject. Any other questions or observations? Uh, maybe some of you have cunning algorithms that you use daily. Has there been any research on how humans do that? So if you go like a London cabbie, it sounds like the landmark. Oh, how do humans do this? That's a good yeah. question. Yes. How does a cabbie find the shortest path? Yeah. I don't know. And yes. <laughs> uh, so they, I mean, they have medically. You know, expanded hippocampuses, don't they? <laughs> they've, uh, they've examined the hippocampus and discovered bits of their brain sort of swollen somehow. Yeah. But it's an interesting question. 
So and I, know, I know, also, and we also interest them to give humans some sort of awkward maps and see how well they did. Because I suspect that our, the heuristics we're used to about you know distance, uh, like even if you look at an ordinary map, you don't really know how much faster the, the you know the red road is than the little white road. You sort of guess, don't you? But uh, I suspect that computers probably do quite a lot better than people uh, because they know some of that. Yeah. I was thinking about the problem with traffic and, and how it's dynamic. Oh yeah. And it must make the weights and the distances of the edges change. Yes. yes. So there has to be a parallel family of algorithms that to are deal with dynamic. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So and the question is, what well, what happens if the weights on the edges change, and, and which happens? So to they, ma they must take the difference yeah. between uh, the original <coughs> value and, and the current value, <coughs> and somehow uh, yeah. avoid the computing. Whole distance, yes, uh, the They must be doing something, and I don't know of any academic. I mean, this is not my own, right? So I'm, I'm a complete amateur at this. I just read it up for you, but, but, <laughs> but, also, also, but um, um, you, would, you would think there would be academic papers about that, but it turns out that sometimes. Some of this work is done only in the Googles and Microsofts of this world, I mean, right? and it's hidden away. You know, we should get extracted out and publish it. I've heard of it being done in a certain ride sharing company. Certain what sharing? Uber. Uber must do this, of course, yes. So, um, but I wish that they'd publish their arguments. Um, and they make a lot of money by having it. Well, they think they make the money out of that. I bet they, they really make the money out of lots of other things. I really doubt. Usually, the wonderful thing about computer science is it's like a, it's like a fractal. It, you know, it, it's it's. Wherever you dig, there's more excitement, more depth, more interest. And if you publish something that says, you know, here's my algorithm, actually, if somebody tries to reproduce that, there's still streets behind you because you've, you know, you spent three years engineering it, and you also you have thought of three improvements to it since then. So, typically, I think companies are more, uh, what's the word, worried about their intellectual property than they should be. Uh, and Microsoft, to, I've been, I've worked for Microsoft for 20 years now. When I first worked for Microsoft, they were very anxious about open source. And now, lots of Microsoft, you know, core products are open source. So I think, you know, the message is getting through. <coughs> right. Yes? When I do um, searches like this on Google, what often happens is that it shows me two or three different rules, mm -hmm. like from Brighton to Birmingham, go east or west of our yeah. Brighton, which are very far apart and make only really five minutes difference. How would you incorporate them? Oh, good question. So, yes, yeah, so, so Google often shows you several routes which you might want to choose because you have you, know, you want to go past your sister's law on the, on the way um, and um, and they don't differ very much so it would show you maybe I wonder if it does it I can't think how I don't really know how it does that I could imagine doing it by saying okay so let's knock out that one somehow disqualify it what's the next best one but you might find one that was only a tiny bit different how to make sure that it's you know markedly different I don't really know that's another very interesting question yeah good somebody at the back I'll just say um, was great talk. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, do these algorithms um, have trouble with things like mountains and lakes? Do they have trouble with mountains and lakes? Well, just think of the graph. I mean, if there's a long road around a lake from you know, two points that are geographically close together but in distance further far apart, then in your, the graph, the vertices and the edges, you'd have a long edge between those two. So, no, it, it doesn't know about the mountains and the lakes. That's all hidden by the abstraction. You just got the vertices and the distances between them. So, yeah, if it's uphill and your cars drive slowly, it takes longer to get. So, of course, you need to you need to measure those times, either by actually measuring them. I suppose you could predict based on the geographical terrain how long it would take if you weren't prepared to actually drive it and measure it. Yeah, I guess, I guess for um, the A star algorithm, that's like a pathological case, right? Which is you your points, you have a massive mountain range in the middle, you're greedily going right to the mountain range and then you have to go, to it and then yeah. try to go around. Yeah. But the landmarks would fix that, I guess. So yeah, yeah. maybe so you put landmarks around. But remember, A star is not confused by the fact that there's something that looks geographic. Oh, sorry, yes, if you're using the crow flies distance, yeah. you're right, it would be deceived by that, yes. But the landmarks thing sorts that out completely, which is so brilliant, right? Just totally not deceived by these artificial things. Yes, in fact. Ah, oh, excellent question. How do you codify quiet routes or select select for quiet routes? 
Right, I don't talk about that either. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like you, you, you'd, have yeah. a, you'd have labels on your edges which has a big number if it's, if it's a busy room, and then you'd have a separate set of labels which is for if you don't care about how busy the room is. Right, right, you can sort of you, penalize you plot your, you plot busy your, rooms. You plot your route based on, you'd have two versions of the graph basically, and you plot your route based on which one they chose. Yes, yeah, so I suppose you could plot your weights based on yeah, if you care a lot about how busy it is, but not really about how far you cycle. Yeah. Then you could penalise the busy yeah. routes a lot. If you really care about how far you, yeah. Then you've got to pre-compute all this landmark data for each setting. So, yes. Yeah. What sort of trade-off between like, having landmarks in you know, a different way? Let's have one there that you can copy. And what's the trade-off between how many landmarks? As far as I, I don't, I mean, this isn't my work, so I don't really know, but I have the strong impression that once you get to about 10, uh, going to 20 or 50 doesn't make a lot of difference. But going from 2 to 10 makes a huge difference. And you can see why, because then there's always going to be a landmark that's somehow somewhat behind your destination. Mm-hmm. Maybe that doesn't work so, maybe that works better while your destinations are all near the middle of the map, right? So you might want to arrange that you have some landmarks that are in a sort of halo, you know, more distant than really you're hoping for. Yeah? Uh, yes, yeah. you said that it's like a really big abstraction and a quite powerful one, the fine number. Yeah. But so how does the team think about the mapping problems? Well, I've used the mapping as my source of intuition, but the abstraction is still useful. That is, if I was doing, you know, perk charts for how long it takes my jobs to complete, then still the lower bound, you know, there might be a differently, the lower bound estimation mechanism might be completely different, and landmarks might be completely useless. You may have some other way. So that's true. The landmarks thing is geographically. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. True, true. It works anywhere there's, there's a triangle of inequality. I suppose the reason that mapping is sort of become quite dominant is because it's a big source of really big graphs. Like right? these graphs have you know 30 million vertices in them. Yeah, just curious, yes, I don't know. Maybe something like routing circuit boards or something might have something of the same flavour, you know, because of, they have, they can have a lot of vertices. But yes, for a perk chart with, you know, 50 tasks to complete and, you know, just anything will work. Like, you could do brute force. Yeah? So, so far we've seen that you optimize the algorithm where you add more data to the... Yeah. Is it's a vicious route to be the most efficient without having more data? Oh, how would you know? So, is your question is, how would you know whether you had found the most efficient algorithm without adding more data, without, I don't know, that's good, that's also a good question, that's a sort of, um, you know, because every time you have an algorithm you think, well, it could be a more efficient one. For some algorithms, like sorting, we know that there are no algorithms that have a complexity less than n log n, so you know, there must be at least a number of comparisons, but I suppose for this I don't know of any complexity bound that says, you, you know, could you do as well as linear in the length of the shortest path, well, uh, I don't know of a formal complexity bound, no. Surely you could pre-compute everything and then it just be a lower. Very true. I mean, so that would be one extreme. Yes, just <coughs> you pick up the distance from everywhere to everywhere, do a table lookup, now you've got a lot of data. <laughs> uh, a very fast algorithm. That's a very good point. Yes, I should, I should in, in this sort of talk, because there's this dial between not much data and a lot of computation, and a lot of data and no computation, and this A-star land, landmark thing form sits really nicely in the middle. Uh, oh yes, yeah. So how about, for example, Google? Do they pre-calculate uh, lower uh, lower bounds for um, the Cartesian product of every possible and oh, every what possible do, what do Google pre-calculate? I don't know. Does anybody work for Google? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I have the faintest idea. Like, for example, the Cartesian product of every possible landmark to every possible destination. That would be quite a big data set. So every possible landmark, I mean, if you only have a few dozen landmarks, then computing the distances to every destination, that's not so bad, right? If you've got 10 landmarks and uh, you know, 30 million destinations, not so bad. If you've got 30 million landmarks and 30 million destinations, now you're into something quite big. No, there has to be a concept of local landmarks, right? Local landmarks, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why. Maybe you could do that. So uh, you, I think you can see why, just from this dialogue, right, that this is a much richer problem than you might at first suppose. Right, there's, you know, there's, there's stuff to be had. I'm in your hands now, because uh, you know, I'm, I'm done. You can go on as long as, as, long as no, you want, no, but it's not me keeping you all here. It's you. <laughs> in particular, you're the chair.
Um, there was something something you had back. I have a question around like you showed an example of an evaluation of like performance on a particular map. Is there a set of tests that like you know, all the papers do in order to compare the performance? Or yes, so there are papers. In fact, I read one of them on, on the um, in preparing for this talk, and the paper was nothing. It said nothing about any of the algorithms. It just gave twenty algorithms and gave their performance against the particular data set. But it was a 1998 paper. I don't know whether there's a, you know, a fit for the 21st century <coughs> data set that everybody uses. It wouldn't surprise me if by now there was, because people increasingly, particularly in these sort of you know, cloudy days, are, are thinking, I'll just put my data set up where people never want to get it in. I, but I don't know for sure. It would make sense, right, to say. I bet that if, if you wanted Andrew Goldberg's database of all the European votes, he'd probably give it to you. But whether that's, you know, whether we're using the same one, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So when you talk about HDI, you talk about having the main knowledge about the class of graphs. Yes, about the, the lower bound thing, that's the main knowledge, yeah. And then we went straight to the main knowledge about the specific graph. Is there any uh, the main knowledge in the previous? Oh, well, is there any debate? So I gave you the, the, the landmark stuff as the main knowledge about geographic graphs. So you're saying, could, is there any sort of property of graphs in general? Well, the landmarks is the property about one graph, which is the graph of the graphs that we want to Well, yes, it pre computes information about one graph. Right. Yes. I think without pre computing anything, um, I mean, even, even the geographic location of each node, that's sort of domain specific. We need, we need to know that to compute the crow flies distance. One more question? I'm sorry? Let's do one more question and one then question. we'll wrap it up. You, I was just going to ask if you happen to know what Microsoft use in there. What do Microsoft use? I don't know, but I think it's highly likely that they use something like um, the things that I've shown you. Because Andrew, you know, he works for Microsoft Research, but I'm sure he was talking to the Bing guys. <laughs> So, but I'm, I'm so sure this visit would be bizarre if he wasn't wrong because I have personal knowledge. <coughs> but I bet it is. But that's what we've been used to. Good. Shall we take it to the pub? Yeah, 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 uh, I know if you can pub. come. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I need